hello hello and welcome back to another episode of general conference conversations the podcast where we have conversations about general conference i'm your host kaylin and i'm super excited to be here with you guys today discussing the words of christ's chosen leaders so let's get right into it i am extremely excited about today's talk um We are reading and discussing President Nelson's um, Sunday morning session talk, Peacemakers Needed. Now this is his second? No. First. Oh yeah, he didn't, he didn't speak in the Saturday sessions this year. That kind of threw me off, honestly, that he didn't speak in the in the in any of the Saturday sessions. I was like, this is so weird. Usually he speaks um, in at least one of the Saturday sessions, but he didn't this year. So this is his first, or this this conference, I guess. So this is his first talk of the April twenty twenty three um, conference was Sunday morning. And man, it was a doozy of a talk. I, uh, I, I hope that I can kind of get across everything that I felt while reading this talk, but it is a lot. There's so much packed into this talk. And so I say this every episode, but I lit, I, I really, really mean it this time read this talk, watch it, listen to it. Um, If not before you listen to me, (laughs) at least at some point, like dig into this talk because there's no way I'm going to be able to do it justice in half an hour, 45 minutes. Um, And also just on my own, there's just so much goodness packed into this. I was like hiding, highlighting quotes and things that I wanted to share. And I was like, I'm just going to end up reading this whole thing out loud. (laughs) Like I have to stop. I have to stop being like, oh, I could read this one. Oh, I could read this one. I was also thinking about, I have, I post a quote, um, on Instagram and Facebook every time I announce that a new episode's come out. And I'm like, I don't know which one I'm going to choose because there are so many amazing quotes in this talk and so it's going to be really hard for me to choose just one. Maybe I'll choose a couple because they're just so so good. Anyway, so (laughs) on that note, I guess I'll jump right in. Um, If you have watched my my videos before, listened to my podcast before, you know that I have a special place in my heart for peace. And um, the, the, just the concept of peace and what peace is meant for me in my life. And so I'll share very quickly what I normally share when peace comes up because this is about peacemakers. So I want to keep this kind of in your mind as we talk about being a peacemaker. I had a friend years and years ago who told me, he said, peace is not an emotion, it's a state of being. And so you can be at peace and also be feeling other emotions. You can be at peace and happy, obviously. You can be at peace and sad. You can be at peace and grieving or upset or frustrated. Those are all very human, normal emotions to feel, right? And it's it's healthy to process those emotions in a healthy way. Um, it's healthy, healthy to feel those emotions. It's it's totally normal to grieve the passing of a loved one or be frustrated when something doesn't work out the way you wanted it to or the way you expected it to. <clears throat> you don't get a job or you don't get into a college you wanted to go get into or you break up with a significant other or a divorce happens or whatever it may be, right? There's things that make us upset or people, somebody wrongs you. Somebody does something really, really terrible that affects you. It's okay to feel those emotions. The peace comes from our faith in Christ, our faith that 
in the case of losing a loved one, faith that we'll see them again. Um, in the case of something going wrong that or not going right the way we wanted it to, faith that God and Christ have a plan for us and that it'll all work out the way that they want it to work out, the way that they have it planned, the way that they see our our what's what I'm looking for? I just totally blinked. The, this, the way they see the trajectory of our lives going, um, the faith that if somebody does wrong us, that they will be judged fairly, that we will be judged fairly when we make deci like wrong decisions, right? We make bad decisions. And so that peace comes from the faith of that. We're still going to grieve, we're still going to be upset, we're still going to be sad, we're still going to be excited when things happen to us. But the peace comes in knowing that we can't control everything and that's okay. That we trust God and Jesus Christ to take care of things for us. And so the concept of peacemaker is like really fascinating to me in that context, right? Of like, okay, as a peacemaker, what is my job then? What is my job as a peacemaker to make peace in other people's lives or to encourage peace? <laughs> Can't force peace on somebody, but encourage peace. And, you know, the first things that come to mind for me are just reminding them that they're loved and seen and they're not alone. Even if they're not particularly religious people, you know, maybe not that we not maybe we don't specifically bring up religion or God or Jesus or the atonement or scripture or something like that, but we remind them that we are there for them, that they have somebody that they can rely on. And that brings peace to a lot of people. And of course, the context that President Nelson is talking about in his talk is in disagreements and contention specifically. He starts out with a really kind of funny uh, story that I'm sure none of us will forget very soon. Um, he was an intern during his surgical internship. Um, the, he was assisting a surgeon who was amputating a gangrene, a leg with gangrene. And it was really hard and one of the team members did something bad and the surgeon was really mad and kind of he said he threw a tantrum which i thought was kind of funny and he threw his scalpel which he'd been using to you know cut this gangrene leg and it landed in president nelson's forearm and everybody was you know horrified that this disgusting i mean one that i'm sure that this disgusting like germ filled scalpel had just stuck into the surgeon, surgical assistant, the surgical intern. And also that like this surgeon's <clears throat> outburst had led to that um, kind of out of line unprofessional. And he said, I didn't become effect infected, but it less, he said, it less left a lasting impression on me. And he promised himself that no matter what happened in his operating room, he would never lose control of his emotions and that he would never throw anything in anger, whether it be scalpel or words. <clears throat> so that was very, you know, perfect. Very good, like, play on words, very good poetry, kind of bringing it full circle kind of thing that he said. And... And then he moves on to talk about how he kind of draws an analogy between that germ-filled scalpel and the contention um, that has infects our civic dialogue and too many personal relationships. And I want to talk about contention for a minute. And I've talked about contention before. 
of course we've talked about contention before um but my kind of thoughts on contention i guess and um he does say this a little bit later of like he's not talking about peace at any cost um he's not talking about never disagreeing with someone he's not talking about never defending your beliefs or your opinions or anything like that but the way that we go about it right and the the difference that's always been in my mind between like contention and conflict is that contention is not useful it's not it's not going anywhere right? You can have conflict with someone. Conflict is a normal part of everyday life. I have conflict with my husband. We disagree on things. We, I do something that upsets him or annoys him. He does something that upsets or annoys me. We're going to have conflict. We're not the same person. <laughs> We're going to have differences and differences of opinion, different ways that we do things. And and conflict can be good like that's how amazing things happen is you get a bunch of people in a room all with different ideas and the conflict the kind of playing off of each other right um can be good it can it can have amazing outcomes it can produce amazing things when we speak up when we say something that you know is bothering us or make a suggestion about a practice that we don't agree with when it gets too far it's kind of everything in moderation right it gets too far when as a surgeon right it, that was a, a moment of conflict. One of his team members did something potentially not great in the middle of a surgery, right? But he took it too far and blew up and yelled and threw a surgical instrument. Like, that, that is not how you deal with conflict. <laughs> that is not conflict management. That is contention. That's blowing up out of proportion. And contention, I think... I agree with President Nelson, it has become, if not more prevalent, much more noticeable and much more easy to engage in um, because of things like social media and just like media in general. <clears throat> It's a lot easier for people to say their piece and then not have to debate or defend things, right? Um, it's really easy for someone to throw up a post on Instagram and turn off the comments and like never engage in any sort of debate about things that other people might disagree with in their opinion. They just they just put it up and then it's done. It's like the last word on the subject. Um, and I've seen that happen with government officials who are kind of pandering to cameras um, and media and a, not a fan base, but like a constituency. <laughs> I feel very fancy using that word. Um, social media influencers, reporters, journalists, celebrities, right? There's just, there's, it's, it's very easy for somebody to state their opinion and then walk away. And of course, that's not, it, that's not a new phenomenon, <laughs> right? Um, that's uh, for, since the beginning of time, somebody can say their opinion and walk away and not defend themselves. But when you say something like that on Instagram that goes out and thousands of people, millions of people possibly see it, right? Um, or you're a politician and it affects not just your country, but the way that the world is working at the moment, that it, it, it's, it's much bigger. It feels like much bigger consequences, a much bigger stage. And even in our personal lives, um, it's the same thing. Right? It's the way that we talk to each other, the way that we listen to each other. And so for me, that's what contention means, 
is when it's not a healthy debate. Healthy debates are good. Like I, I've loved having conversations with people where they bring up something that I've never thought about before. And I'm like, oh, you've changed my perspective on that. Even if my opinion hasn't changed, right? I'm like, oh, I've never thought of it that way. Or maybe my opinion does change. And I think, wow, thank you for, you know, bringing that to my attention. I never would have thought of it that way. But when it gets to just yelling and not even yelling, but like personal insults, like you can tell when the tone of a discussion, the tone of a debate changes. And it usually it feels very childish and very contentious. Like you can feel the difference, right? So I just want to talk about like specifically talk about contention because I feel like sometimes we use oh you're being contentious with me in kind of the wrong context um in a way sometimes of a way to walk away from a situation that is actually a healthy debate but we're not used to our opinions being challenged and so I think conflict and healthy debate is good contention what person Nelson is talking about is when it it goes too far and he actually lists a couple of things he talks about vulgarity fault finding and evil speaking of others throwing insults um condemning maligning vilifying anyone who does not agree with you and damaging other people's reputation with pathetic and pithy barbs And I think we can all think of examples of that, right? In the news, in the government, in our personal lives, at work, at school, even at church, right? You can think of something that got blown out of proportion, something that didn't get blown out of proportion, but was handled really, really poorly. I can think of many things off the top of my head, right? Of things that just didn't need to be handled the way that it was handled. Could have been something so much smaller, so much less crazy and less chaotic. It could have been, it could have been solved with a conversation or an apology or a hey you hurt my feelings let's talk about it rather than I'm gonna go above your head and complain to your boss and get you fired right there are there are ways to go about things and that's kind of his whole his whole thing here um and how how we can interact with other people as disciples of Jesus Christ using the example of Jesus Christ and charity. Um, Like I said, there are so many, so many good quotes in this talk and I'm only like six paragraphs in and we're already at 20 minutes. So I'm going to (laughs) try and not talk for an hour and a half about this, although I probably could. Um, But he lists a couple more things um anger anger never persuades hostility builds no one contention never leads to inspired solutions that was a good like zinger one-liner right uh he lists a few things of like belittling your spouses and children or angry outbursts used to control others um the silent treatment i'm guilty of that one um bullying bullying among youth and children and employees who defame their colleagues like you can see the difference right they're not having healthy debates about their beliefs and their opinions they are using their power or lack of power to bring somebody else down right they are damaging their reputation they're damaging their physical emotional mental health and that's not okay. Um, he, I thought this was very kind of a, kind of a summary of like his whole talk, right? He says, as disciples of Jesus Christ, we are to be examples of how to interact with others, especially when we have differences of opinion. 
One of the easiest ways to identify a true follower of Jesus Christ is how compassionately that person treats other people. And that's kind of his thesis of this whole talk, right? We are disciples of Jesus Christ. We are to be examples of how we interact with other people because Christ was the perfect example of how to interact with other people, especially people he disagreed with. He called people out. He called he called out hypocrites and he told people that they were being mean and wrong and that they were doing things incorrectly. But he did so with love. He didn't insult them personally. He didn't call out every single one of their sins for people to see, right? He didn't go to their bosses and have them fired. He showed the right way to be living by example and by loving people. And I love that last line, one of the easiest ways to identify a true follower of Jesus Christ is how compassionate a person treats other people. And I can think of people in and out of the church who are absolutely amazing examples of followers of Christ outside of our church, like other Christians, also people who are not religious at all, who are just the kindest people you will ever meet. And like I aspire to be them, right? Like I think about people that I went to high school, middle school with who we were teenagers and they were so mature and so like <sighs> compassionate, like we had very different worldviews, but they still loved me and still wanted to be my friend and like didn't think I was crazy for being a Mormon. Like they, they just loved me for who I was. And that's not always a given with people. Um, so he goes on to talk about the savior being very clear about his followers being peacemakers um, and to love your enemies and bless those that curse you, right? All of those kind of terrifyingly amazing verses that we think about in the scriptures. We're like, how are you supposed to do that? How are you supposed to love your enemies? How are you supposed to, you know, give them the other cheek when they've literally just hit you? Like what that does not compute in our mortal brains. But he says the savior's message is clear his true disciples build lift encourage persuade and inspire that is our goal that is our commission as followers of jesus christ to build lift encourage persuade and inspire and then he talks about here yeah, i was gonna read this paragraph about contention um he's very forceful in this um paragraph about contention he says make no mistake about it contention is evil jesus christ declared that those who have the spirit of contention are not of him but are of the devil who is the father of contention and the devil stirreth up the hearts of men to contend with anger one with another those who foster contention are taking a page out of satan's playbook whether they realize it or not no man can serve two masters we cannot support satan with our verbal assaults and then think that we can still serve god and I was like, dang, President Nelson, you are just calling everybody out, right? In just like the greatest way possible, right? I felt I I felt very much like uh, like Jacob, Jacob in the Book of Mormon. He's like, I don't want to say this to you, but I have to because y'all are just like, you need to hear this. And President Nelson is, does a really, really good job of doing that, of like, I love you guys and you're doing amazing, but also we can do better um, in the way that doesn't make you feel all like guilty and weird, but just is like, yeah, I can do better. I can do better than this. So, <clears throat> especially that last sentence, we cannot support Satan with our verbal assaults and then think that we can still serve God. And I think we all slip up, right? We're all going to say something that we don't mean. We're all going to, in a burst of anger or frustration or just like an upwelling of emotion, anxiety, depression, whatever it is, right? We're still human. We're going to say things that we regret. 
Um, we're not going to be perfect in this regard. We're not going to be able to stay completely calm when someone's like yelling at us or someone's frustrating us. And I don't think we are expected to. But we are expected to notice when we are being contentious, when we have said something that we didn't mean or that was upsetting or not nice to somebody else um and to apologize and to take take ownership of that and like acknowledge that right there's there's it's the repentance part of it it's the the reconciliation part of it even as we do make a verbal assault which sounds very scary and crazy um we can still apologize and, and we can move past it. Um, he goes on to talk about how we treat others really matters. How we speak to others at home and at church and online really matters. And he asks us to interact with others in a higher and holier way. And he has used that phrase so many times over the last five years, right? About come follow me, about ministering, about so many things right a higher and holier way um and he quotes the uh, 13th article of faith about i think virtuous lovely of good report or praiseworthy but he talks about it as something that we anything virtuous lovely of good report or praiseworthy that we see about other people that we can say about other people whether it's to them or some, to somebody else that should be our method of communication, that we should be praising people all day long. And I thought that was so cool to like use, because when I think of the 13th article of faith, and I think of something virtuous, lovely, or good, or poor, or praiseworthy, I think of things, I think of ideas, I think of objects, I think of whatever. I think of you know actions that somebody has done but i think it's amazing and i don't think i ever kind of put that together of thinking of it in regards to a trait in somebody else like what about my husband is virtuous lovely of good report or praiseworthy what about my fellow ward members my young women that i serve with the presidency i serve in the my family my friends what about them is virtuous, lovely, of good report, or praiseworthy, and how, how can I tell them that? How can I just heap that praise on them? And I think about that also in in a in a moment of contention, in a moment of conflict, how powerful that could be. You're disagreeing with someone, you're in a heated kind of debate about something, and you can feel it sort of changing to that it's not quite conflict anymore, it's more contention, we're getting to the eh part of it. Pausing and being like, what do I love about this person? What do I, even if it's just basically like they are passionate about their opinion right now and that is awesome. Can you imagine the like effect that would have on a conversation like that? Pausing and being like, I am so impressed by how passionate you are right now. I am so impressed with the depth of your knowledge on this topic. I am like so impressed by how eloquently you are stating your opinion or your, the research that you've done. The effect that would have on a conversation like that, just like, I mean, it depends on the person too, right? <laughs> like it's not gonna have, it's not gonna work every time. But the, also the effect that would have on you, if you feel yourself getting to that point of wanting to like, just like you're so kind of pent up in this it's very emotionally charged environment to step back for a second and be like man this person is so like amazing this is amazing this is a fantastic conversation and i think about conversations i've had with people especially people in my personal life who are very close to me very important relationships to have in my life even if we disagree on a lot a lot of things where conversations have gotten contentious or i have felt like i want to be contentious or i feel like i just need to walk away from a situation because it's getting too much i think about the power that that would have had 
in a conversation like that um, blows my mind. And like thinking about that in having having that as like a tool in further conversations, future conversations with this person of like, wow, it would be probably really good to stop in the middle of a conversation if it's getting really contentious and be like, you know what? This is amazing how passionate you are about things. Maybe let's pick up a different day when we're not feeling so emotionally charged about this, right? Um, anyway, I thought that was so cool. And so my question kind of off of that is how can you interact with other people with other people in this higher and holier way that President Nelson describes? What can you think of somebody in your life maybe that you have kind of difficult conversations with on a daily basis um, or regularly, maybe not on a daily basis, but regularly or just people that you have to you have to communicate with every single day, right? You live with spouses, with kids, with family, with parents, with brothers and sisters, with roommates, um, whoever it may be, right? How can you interact with them in this higher and holier way? And of course, I think I just had this thought, so I have to put it out there. I don't think this applies to like abusive or manipulative relationships. Of course, I think the standard is still to be kind to people, but if you are in an abusive or manipulative relationship situation I don't I think that's a different that's a different can of worms and to make sure that you take care of yourself in that kind of situation anyway he lists a few things also um he lists a uh, couple in your ward gets divorced or a young missionary turns home earlier teenager doubt his testimony they do not need your judgment they need to experience the pure love of Christ through you. Or like he talks about a friend on social media having pro like strong political or social views that are very, very different than everything you believe in. Being angry and <clears throat> cutting and like commenting viciously is not going to help. <laughs> it's going to take a little bit of extra effort. Um, to kind of push past our first snap judgments of people, but it's worth it. And I was talking to my mother-in-law, actually, we were, um, like I said, we were there. We were with them this last weekend for family reunion. And she was talking about uh, my husband didn't serve his full two years. He was at home in the beginning of the pandemic. So he served about 13 months. And she was talking about how um, in her mind, when people say, oh, for this t the two years that you serve, she's like, she automatically switches it to 13 months for Ashton, for Ashton specifically. And she was like, I think that when all of that happened, when so many missionaries were sent home early, it changed the way that we thought about full-time missionary service. And I had a lot of well, even before the pandemic, I had a lot of missionary friends who got sent home early. Um, out of my MTC district, there were nine of us, and one went home within three months, one went home within four and a half, five months. Um, one of the elders broke his arm on the mission. I think he served the full two years but he was close to being sent home because usually they don't let you stay out if you have surgery and stuff. He got surgery on the mission, which is very kind of rare. Usually they send you home for big medical things like that. But he very well could have been sent home within the first, I think, three months. It was very early on. Um, one of my MTC companions, she went home at the beginning of the pandemic. It wasn't for pandemic related stuff but she did get sent home or she she chose to go home she felt that her mission was done like she was ready to go home and i remember kind of talking to all of them and being like you served a full-time mission a full-time mission does not mean that you serve your full time 18 years 18 18 years wow 18 months or two years it means that you were 
a full-time missionary. You were a missionary full-time for whatever, like when we talk about full-time, right? It's 40 hours a week, eight hours a day, whatever that means for your company, right? Usually 40 hours a week. As a missionary, you're usually working more than 40 hours a week. <laughs> and like she was a set, they were set apart full-time missionaries for however long they served, but they served a full-time mission. And their full-time mission happened to be three months or six months or 13 months or 10 months. Um, and I think that really changed the way that people thought about because it was such a cultural stigma to come home early from a mission. Like I remember the my the missionaries that I knew who came home before the pandemic, how terrified they were to go home early and to be judged for coming home early, for not being able to finish their mission because the assumptions were, oh, you did something wrong or you broke a rule or you are not worthy anymore and so you got sent home or you just weren't able to do it, right? You weren't strong enough to finish. That was the kind of cultural thought around missionaries going home early. And when so many missionaries were sent home for like not their fault at all, right? They couldn't control the pandemic. <laughs> they couldn't control that they had to go home. They had pre-existing health conditions or that they were in a foreign country, right? A lot went back out, but a lot didn't. They served seven, eight, 19 months, right? And or even the elders who only got to serve 22 months or tw just 21 months, they had to go, they went home a couple of transfers early. And I think that really changed the way people thought about and saw early returned missionaries. I think there's still a stigma around it. I don't, I'm not a missionary anymore and so I'm not sure, but I think the way we think about it is very different. And so I like that he put that specifically of like, we don't know. We don't know why a couple is getting divorced. We don't know why a missionary is coming home early. We don't know why a teenager is doubting his testimony. They don't need our judgment. They don't need us to say, well, just toughen up and go back out, right? Or you screwed up your marriage. They need love and support. And so does our friend on social media who has very difficult, different and political social views. This is hard for me. I, um... A lot of times I will just kind of unfollow people, not like people that I'm not super close to, right? I'll be following somebody that I served a mission with or that I went to high school with and I'm like, I don't talk to you on a daily basis and so I don't really need to be whatever. It's hard when I have somebody who's very close to me who has a very different political views. This is something I'm working on. <laughs> something I'm very much working on. Okay. Um, He talks about how we can literally change the world this way. We can literally change the world one person, one interaction at a time by modeling how to manage honest differences of opinion with mutual respect and dignified dialogue. And he talks about President Oaks and President Eyring, how much respect he has for them. He's like, we have very different opinions on things. We think about things and situations very differently. We have different life experiences and pasts and opinions on things right um but the way that they they the way that they disagree is with love and support and um and he talks about how charity is the antidote to contention that charity defines a peacemaker um the pure love of Christ defines a peacemaker. And I think that's so, well, obvious, but also so beautiful that love, love is the answer to contention. And that's what we were just talking about, right? As we see and we, we like look for the things that we love and admire in other people, it's so much harder to yell at them, <laughs> right? Um, especially on social media when you're not face to face with somebody, it can be really easy to forget that it's a real person on the other end of this conversation. It can be really easy to forget that 
they have a family, they have friends, they have a whole life and that they are going through and figuring out the world just as we are. Um, and to remind ourselves of that and to remind ourselves that they're, you know, just as fallible, just as beautiful, just as loved by God as we are. Really helpful and really important. Um, okay, so I have a couple more quotes that I want to either read or just talk about. Um, this one, I was called out. <laughs> I remember being called out um, when I was listening to conference by this quote. He said, at this point, you may be thinking this message would really help someone you know. Perhaps you are hoping that it will help him or her be nicer to you. I hope it will. But I also hope that you will look deeply into your heart to see if, you, if there are shards of pride or jealousy that prevent you from becoming a peacemaker. And I remember him saying that and I sat there and I was like, well, shoot, I was just thinking about all the people that I hope this will help. <laughs> I was thinking of very specific people that I hope this would help. And I felt very called out. And so I want uh, the same kind of question for you. How can this challenge to be a peacemaker change your actions? Take this invitation to heart. Speaking of invitations, the last quote I want to read um, is the invitation that President Nelson gives at the very end of his talk that I thought was just beautiful. He says, my, my dear brothers and sisters, the best is yet to come for those who spend their lives building up others. Today, I invite you to examine your discipleship within the context of the way you treat others. I bless you to make any adjustments that may be needed so that your behavior is ennobling, respectful, and representative of a true follower of Jesus Christ. So I love that invitation. Examine your discipleship within the context of the way you treat others. I think that's so powerful. To That's a lot of what we know about Christ is how he interacted with other people, right? A lot of the, the gospels and the the accounts of his ministry are how he interacted with others, how he healed them, how he listened, how he dined with sinners and tax collectors, right? We know his actions. We know how he treated other people. And so as we kind of measure our own discipleship and, and how we are becoming like Christ through how we treat other people, I think that's really, really powerful. And so I want you to really take that invitation to heart as well. Um, And, and read this whole talk, like read all of it and just dive into it because it is so good. And there are so many quotes that I wish I could have read, but I'm already at like 43 minutes. This is the longest episode I've had in a while. It's just such a good talk. So amazing. So just so quintessentially President Nelson and everything that he's been teaching us and and encouraging us to do for the last five years of his his pre presidency so 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 good and to repeat my questions for you um let me find them really quick how can you interact with others um in the higher and holier way president nelson describes and kind of along the same route, I think, but just kind of said in a different way. How can this challenge to be a peacemaker change your actions specifically? As for further reading, um, most of his footnotes are scripture. And so I highly encourage you to go through his footnotes and look at those scriptures that he he quotes because I'm sure there's just but then specifically footnotes 1, 8, and 18 um, he gives a couple of like extra commentary on the scriptures specifically or on things that he's saying in his talk so check those out 1, 8, and 18 and I'll put those in the show notes as well that's all I've got for you today 
45 minutes almost precisely, <laughs> at least right now as I'm recording. That will change when I edit, but <laughs> exciting stuff. Um, thank you so much for listening and or watching this episode. Um, we are on to the Saturday afternoon session next week, which means we're only, was it six, two, three, four, five, six, seven, oh, there's eight. Wow, there's more than I thought. We are eight episodes, so about four weeks from the end of this season, the end of this conference, which I guess makes sense because we're already in August. <laughs> That's insane. Um, so next week we will start on the Sunday afternoon session with President Oaks. Um, as always, I'm on Facebook and Instagram at John Conference Conversations. Uh, you can follow me there for updates. You can subscribe on YouTube or follow on your podcast of choice. Um, I also love comments and reviews and emails and messages. I love hearing from you guys and hearing your thoughts. Um, all of that will be in the show notes if you're interested. And I will talk to y'all next time.